There we go. And you are live. Hello, and welcome to another virtual author event at the Poison Pen Bookstore. I'm John Charles, and our very special guest author today is New York Times bestselling Simone St. James, whose latest book is The Book of Cold Cases. Before we begin today, I do want to let those tuning in know that the Poison Pen does have copies of Simone's latest book, and she has sent us a few precious signed book plates to include with those who are early to order their copy. So if you'd like one of the Book of Cold Cases, please give us a call or go online and we would be happy to put one in the mail or hold one for you to pick up at the store. And now I'd like to welcome one of my favorite authors, Simone. Hi, hi, John. Hi, everybody. <laughs> it's delightful to have you here, even if it's just virtually. I know. I, I wish I was there in person, but it's, yeah. um, I think Phoenix is like really, like really nice this time of year compared to where I am. So <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's probably true. I always like to know about the person the author was before they became a writer. So what can you tell us about yourself before you were a writer? Um, I, you know, in a way I had always wanted to be a writer, although I had never actually seriously thought of it as like something that you could do like for real. Like it was always something I had done for myself. It was always, I had always written my own stories and then just sort of you know, put them in a drawer. I'd never even considered being a, an author. So writing and reading had always been a big part of my life. Um, I spent 20 years um, in the television business, which sounds exciting, but was not because I was doing all the behind the scenes stuff. Um, the job I did for the last 10 years of that was like literally spreadsheets. I literally had a desk job. Wow. Someone has to like figure out how much they're spending on every single show and versus how much we're supposed to spend and do it all in a spreadsheet. That was literally my job. It was not very exciting. <laughs> so I, I say I was in the television business. People are like, oh, wow. Like I was like a war correspondent or something. I was like, no, I did spreadsheets. <laughs> so what I had this office job and um, I would do that during the day. And then the evenings I would come home to my husband and we, I would write in the evenings and I would write on my commute and I would write in my lunch hours. And I did that for years and years and years. Like that was something I did for a long time. And um, it took me many years to, of, of querying to, before I got published, it took me several full manuscripts that got rejected everywhere. And so I, I, that was my life for a long time was, was doing my, my desk job during the day and then doing the thing that I really love to do in the evenings and weekends and holidays, and Christmas holidays, you know, that's, I used all my holiday time to, to write. So yeah, that was really what it was like for a long time for me. I've read that you wrote your first book because you wanted to read a ghost story that was creepy, but not gory and had a little of romance in it. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I've been reading a lot of uh, Mary Stewart, who was a very popular Gothic writer in the 60s, and I think the 70s. Mm -hmm. And she does not have paranormal elements in her books. Um, specifically, I mean, they're kind of suspenseful. Um, they're wonderful books. And um, so I was just reading a lot of that. And I was like, just nobody writes this anymore. And, and I wanted to kind of write that kind of a Gothic book. But like with more mod a little more modern and with some real romance in it and then actually add like real real ghosts and real paranormal elements and i it, it was a very specific kind of book that i just really had the craving to read and no one was writing it and i i came up with the idea my the idea for my first book i did not i did not have an agent i did not have a publisher i didn't have a book deal i had nothing i was again i was just an office worker who was just writing in my own time and I came up with the idea for my first book and I thought it's like, as a reader to me, it appealed to me. I was what I wanted to read. And so I just wrote it because I wanted to know the end of the story. And that's the one I sent out and that I, I got, an, got an agent from it and the agent sold it. So for me, when I started that book, I mean, it really was just, it was a very specific thing that I wanted to read um, and just no one would write it for me. <laughs> And I didn't think anyone else, when I wrote it, I didn't think anyone else would ever want to read it. Like, I was like, I think I'm the only person who wants to read this, but I'll try. And, you know, it kind of just ended up, that was the path that ended up opening up. And that was The Haunting of Maddie Claire? That was, your that was The Haunting of Maddie Claire, yeah. 
And much to your surprise, or maybe not to your surprise, it was popular. It won at least one award, to my knowledge. And yeah, it did. It, it did. It won, um, well, the Romance Writers of America gave it uh, Rita. And um, a Crime Writers of Canada here in Canada gave it an Arthur Ellis Award. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it did. It did pretty well for a debut book. Um, and it was it came out in 2012. And so it was kind of like um, like I, it, the publisher bought the book in 2010, but it actually released in 2012. And in between those two things, uh, borders went under. So it was kind <laughs> of like I, it kind of felt like the whole at the time, it felt like the whole publishing biz- industry was just going to sink right before my first book came out, which was not the case, but that's what it felt like to a debut author. It felt like, oh my God, everything's falling apart right before I get the chance to have a book out. So it was a little bit, it was a little bit stressful there, like Rocky for those couple of years, but um, the book did end up doing well. And they, my publisher was like, okay, well, you know, we want another one. And and that's kind of how the business goes. It's, it's kind of book to book where they're just, you just like every book you're like, do you want another one? And they're like, okay, or, or no, <laughs> hasn't happened yet. But, <laughs> but I get some point you're like, how about this? Does this sound good? And they go, okay. And you just kind of go from book to book. I mean, you don't really make long range plans. Mm-hmm. You just try and come up with the best ideas you can come up with one after the other and hope that they like it. <laughs> and that leads us to your latest book, which is the book of cold cases. Can you tell us a little bit about that book? Uh, sure. Yeah. It's um, it's, I, I'm a huge, uh, also a huge obsessed with true crime. And so my last couple of books, I've kind of wanted to pull my love of true crime into the mix. Um, so it's a sort of a, a, a suspense, which has true crime mixed in, in again, my, the paranormal elements and romantic subplots. And very briefly, it's about um, an infamous 1970s serial murder case, which is a completely fictional case. I just completely made it up. And um, it was never solved, but a woman was arrested as a serial killer and she was acquitted in court. And 40 years later, a true crime blogger gets the chance to interview her. And she says, well, I'm going to tell you everything that happened in 1977. And they sit down and they have a conversation and it's kind of a wild story. And um, it just sort of spins out from there. And um, Um, Both of the protagonists have had their own brush with true crime. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, One was an abduction that she escaped from, and the other was um, possibly her parents might have had some kind of crime happen to them. I don't want to reveal too much, but they they both have that kind of connect, real personal connection to it. But in some ways, they're also very different. Can you talk about those two protagonists? Because one is a little bit further down the road where she's willing to do anything. The other still has a little bit more humanity. Yeah, um, I really enjoyed the idea of these two women sitting down and having, it's a very, very common in in any type of a crime novel or traditional crime novel. It's very, very common to have a scene with where both of these characters are men where one is some type of an investigator sometimes it's a cop or a detective or a journalist or something and the other person is potentially a criminal mm-hmm. or killer or whatever and the two of them are sitting face to face and one person is trying to get one man is trying to get the other man to tell the truth that's a very common that's a very common scene and so i thought it was fun for me to switch that up and what if that scene they were both women what if the interrogator was a woman and what if the potential serial killer was a woman and um they're going to go head to head there's a real cat and mouse game going on in their in their conversations um beth who was the accused serial killer who was acquitted and maybe she was a killer maybe not you know she's got her own agenda and shay who's the true crime blogger is trying to figure out what why Beth has agreed to talk to her and what she's after. And Beth is sort of leading her in different directions and how she answers the questions. And Shay is trying to figure out what Beth isn't telling her. And there was just a lot of, I just had a lot of fun with that because that dynamic is very different when you have two women and how they interact is very different. So for me, it was a lot of fun to go down that road with those two characters because they seem like there seem like hero, like it seems like heroine and villain, but they really have, like as you say, they have more in common than you'd think. 
and they actually kind of get, a, each of them gets a lot out of this interaction. Um, I wouldn't say it's friendship, although n- neither one of them really wants to admit that. It's not really because one of them is potentially a killer, but it's, there is a, each one of them is getting something out of it um, and sort of seeing things a little bit differently than they'd ever seen things before. So um, it was a lot of fun to have those two characters be very opposites, but also in a lot of ways be mirroring each other. You did a masterful job with it. Um, you have these wonderful characters and then you have this completely creepy house, the Greer yes, Mansion. It's a creepy house. <laughs> that really plays an important role in your books. Um, can you talk a little bit about, do you know in advance, this is what we're at, where I want to set a book? Does it come to you as you write it? What role does setting play for you? Yeah, setting is very important. I, it just seems to me that if you're going to write specifically a ghost story, any type of a really spooky something that has the paranormal in it, just in my opinion, you know, the more you can make that setting really come alive, the, just the richer your story is. And yeah, this, I did, I do know the settings. I always know my settings really early on. Mm. Um, And I wanted to do, I mean, this was, this is my eighth ghost story. And so once you've written enough ghost stories, it's like you, you do, you can't just do uh, the same old, well, there's a, house and it's Victorian and there's you know and there's there's something maybe and so you have to kind of you know change it up a little bit so I I made this house a mid-century modern house from the that was originally furnished and decorated in like the 50s and the 60s and it hasn't changed since the 60s so I really sort of made it it's a different sort of feel to it it's got a almost modern feel to it and yet at the same time everything in this house including the magazines and the ashtrays and the dishes and everything like everything is still there from the 50s and the 60s it's still sitting there so it's it sort of has this creepy feel to it and beth who lives there like when when shay meets her of course beth is like this sort of legendary figure where she was acquitted of being a murderer and she comes across as this really really you know, confident, like bold sort of woman, like I don't care about anything. And she's Mm -hmm. beautiful. She's still beautiful and like in her sixties and she's just really gorgeous. And so, but that's how she comes across. But then when Shay goes to her house, she realizes that that where Beth lives, like Beth is a, there's something really wrong here. Like very, very, very wrong. (laughs) And it's not what it seems and it's worse than it seems. And um, she can't, you know, she should stay away, but at the same time, this is her chance of a lifetime, literally the chance of a lifetime to interview a a woman who has not given an interview in 40 years. So she kind of is, she has her own obsessions and she's kind of compelled to go back and, you know, no matter what the cost might be. What I think you um, are really smart about as a writer is you give the characters a reason to stay because in most horror books or ghost stories it's like if there's something there that's killing people you're out of the door you know know. (laughs) but in this case there is a reason why your protagonist is there yeah and that that you have to do that if you're writing a ghost story like personally for me personally if there was a ghost I would be gone so fast I would never go back (laughs) I would never but I kind of it, you can structure it different ways like I have done it before like for example the broken girls is a boarding school and the girls are kind of stuck there so you could make your characters literally kind of stuck there mm-hmm. or the famous example is the shining where it's they're in Colorado and it's a snowstorm and they're snowed in mm-hmm. um or you know sometimes with my books I just make it where my my heroine my main character you know she's not perfect and she's got this obsession that's kind of her fatal flaw and it makes her make bad decisions sometimes or decisions that aren't maybe that she wouldn't norm that a normal person wouldn't make because there is this one thing and she she is obsessed with it and she cannot let go of it and she's going to pursue it even if it's a, a danger to herself so I just kind of try and motivate that where it's like as a reader, you might not agree with that it might not be how you act but this is how she acts and human beings act against act oddly all the time and against their logic all the time (laughs) but to them it makes a lot of sense in their head and so that's kind of how I try and motivate with my characters um the book of cold cases also has a dual timeline plot and this is uh, I think the third time that you've done that 
Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about, as an author, were there challenges in writing two different stories and weaving them together? Do you know, do you write one story, then the other? Do you switch back and forth? How do you approach the two storylines? Yeah, it is very, it is very challenging to do. It takes more, you can't really wing it. You have to at least have some organization going into it, uh, a little bit of planning. You can, I mean, I don't, I don't plan down to like, individual chapters or anything like that but you do have to have a little bit of a plan of how you're going to do this otherwise it comes across as very disorganized i don't write like one timeline and then the other and then sew them together i write the book sequentially chapter by chapter by chapter going back and forth that's how i do it um so i always know you know the the chapters that are happening if i'm doing it right will kind of mirror each other or build on each other because that's because I'm writing them one after the other like that. Um, and I just do that. I, it, I really do that. It's based on what the story calls for, because if, if you don't do a past timeline in this particular setup, then I'm going to have a book in which two women sit in the living room and have a conversation for like a hundred pages, you know, <laughs> and that's really interesting. Like at the beginning, you can do that for a few pages as these two women are going back and forth, but like, and then you're just going to have best sitting there going, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. So really, it's it's just the story calls for, as a reader, if you're going to talk about murders happening in the 1970s, as a reader, you want to just be sent right back to the 1970s into that scene. You want to be there. You don't want to just hear Beth talk about it secondhand. You want to be there. So that's just how I organize whether I do a dual timeline or not, is whether, as a reader, uh, do I want to be in this other timeline and if I do then I just I just go there um but it does take a bit of planning and there was a there's a whole section again no spoilers but there's a whole section in the middle of the book that where you go into a the a past timeline and you kind of stay there for a number of chapters and it was like I, that just had to happen that way otherwise again it would have just been like a very long chunk of dialogue so a lot of that kind of comes out organically as I'm telling the story, trying to figure out the best way to do it, which isn't always an easy answer to figure out. Um, now, while your books are contemporary for the most part, there are historical aspects to it. Are there, is there any research involved on your part or is it just from your own memory of the time period? How do you go back and research like the 70s or the 80s? Or um... Well, it's been more fun writing books that have a past timeline in the 70s or the 80s because um there are any number of people you can just ask mm -hmm. <laughs> it's different from writing about the 1920s yeah you know i had to do a lot more digging up of old maps and old books and old magazines and old movies and well you know old photos but i mean i mean i was certainly i i was born in 1974 so i don't remember 1977 when that's this past time happened but i do remember 1982 when the past timeline of the sundown motel happened mm -hmm. and Again, again, if I just want to ask, I just want to know about the 70s, there are people who are just a few years older than me that I can just ask. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really, really easy to do. So I do some, re of course, I do some research. I look at, you know, what, you know, cer certainly researching the fashion is the most fun, mm -hmm. the fashion and the hairstyles. And that's pretty fun in the, the music and the TV shows and the cars is fun. So I, I, you know, and of course the architecture because it was a mid-century modern house. And so I got to research a lot of that. So it's actually a lot more, it's a lot easier to do. It's kind of fun to do those timelines that are in the more recent past also, because it feels very modern, but it's before internet, yes. cell phones, right? So you get to go back into that era before those things and it so it feels different from this era but at the same time it feels very modern so i find it a lot of fun to write in in those more recent eras it also makes solving the crime a little bit more challenging because you can't just google something or do right. DNA testing or something yeah and you know it's it is a challenge because it's hard you know in the present timeline it's hard to to st get away from just scenes of your character googling things mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's not very interesting to read, but that's realistically probably what would happen a lot of the time. So when you go into the more recent timeline, like, 
you know, you, you have people who have to like get in their car and go talk to someone or call somebody up or have a conversation or go to the library and look something up or, you know, or go, go to, you know, a reporter has to go, go talk to people or whatever it is. So you get, you get to put a little more action on the page in those days. Um, and you can do that, of course, in present timelines, but there's a certain point where, you know, your reader's going to be like, wouldn't this person just like look this up or text this person or whatever. So you have to, you have to balance that. It's different if you're writing, like I don't write police, like my main characters are not cops. I don't write police procedurals. A police procedural to me is always interesting to read. Like I'll read, I'll read about a cop looking things up or I don't know what, cause I don't know anything about that life. So that's interesting to me, but I don't write I don't write about in the inter, in your workings of cops. So my character is a blogger. So to write about her just looking something up and writing a blog about it is like the least interesting book. So I have to I have to try find ways to mix it up. Um, and Shay is um, fascinated by true crime, mm -hmm. like so many people. And I think I had read somewhere you were writing about the appeal of true crime. And I think you actually. Um, said something that was very smart. It seemed people think it's a recent thing. They think like in the last few years, all of a sudden true crime became this hot topic, but it's been popular for decades. Um, and Rule was writing in the 80s and the 90s and yeah. all these things. So can you talk about the appeal of true crime, why it's so fascinating to readers and maybe to you as a writer? Um, yeah, I I think that, yeah, I, I think that true crime has been popular for decades. I think that what's changed in the last maybe decade or so is that we've just all decided it's more acceptable to talk about it. Huh. You know, it, in our, you know, in the early eighties when Anne Rule was writing, I mean, first writing, you know, like that was something where like you get the book and you read it and you, there's nobody to talk to about this. You never talk to anybody. It's just something you quietly read. And so now, you know, we've got the internet and we've got podcasts and we've got all these things and so we can just talk about the things that interest us a little more and I think that that's sort of what's come out and um I think that true crime well I think true crime has an endless appeal just to everybody going way back I think part of it is um just the just the pure mystery aspect of it I mean we love mysteries that's why mystery books are you know one of the mainstays of literature I mean we just love a mystery and there are a lot of true crime books. Some of them are, some of these crimes are solved. Some of them have never been, will never be solved. Some of them were solved and maybe now, maybe they were wrong. Some of them weren't solved and now with DNA, they might get solved. I mean, there's just so much fun if you're a mystery lover to be reading about that, it, you know, like that, that's what draws you in. You're like, well, did this person do it or who did it? Or are, are they guilty or innocent? I mean, that's a kind of a primal thing. And I think that for women, it, because um, true crime is very popular with women. I think it just is, um, speaks to like just our life experience, uh, not necessarily like, uh, not necessarily specifically as victims of violent crime, but just as something that is potential can potentially happen to us. And from a very young age, you get taught from a very young age, like don't walk alone at night, don't go to a party and get drunk with a bunch of strange, like that's just, there's, you know, there's all these various, safety things that that girls learn very early and they have to keep in mind for their whole life and i think that true crime sort of is part of how we process that and how we process you know how we have to go through the world mm -hmm. i think for those that may not read it may not appreciate it may not understand it they're kind of looking at like why are these people reading all these grisly gory you know graphic books but i think you're right in some ways for some readers, it allows them to experience experience something that's so horrific from a safe distance. So Very they can kind, so. Of, kind of process it. Yeah, and you can kind of you can kind of process it without actually um, giving out anything personal about yourself. You're just you're mm -hmm. talking about somebody else, right? You're talking about some stranger. So it's very easy to just project whatever it is that's bothering you or you, that gives you anxiety or that you've been thinking about and you project it onto a stranger. And it just feels like you say very safe to do that. I agree. Um, you've also said that your books are about possibilities and exploring fears. Those are kind of the themes that you work with. Can you talk a little bit about those in context of your writing? Well, I get asked all the time, every single time I get asked if I believe in ghosts, 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, I have never experienced a ghost myself, but I just think that they're possible. And I think that anything is possible. So that's sort of where I go. I explore those possibilities in my books. It's not, I mean, the hauntings in my books are all real, but at the same time, I'm exploring in the story, like, what if, you know, what if that, that thing you don't believe in was real? Like, then what would happen? What would you do? What would this character do? What would that character do? What would these various characters do? And it's fun for me to explore, like if if there is actually some type of a paranormal happening, what different characters would do because they would do different things. I've had characters who like refuse to believe it. I've had care and I've had characters who are like, oh, that's a ghost. Yeah, that's what that is. And so it's kind of, it's a different reaction based for different characters. And I like to explore, um, I mean, for me, thematically, the ghost story really explores what we're truly afraid of, you know, death, what happens, we don't know what happens after death, and what we leave behind, and, um, you know, dying with things that aren't done, or things that we regret, and those kinds of deep things, and a ghost story seems like, it doesn't seem like a very deep thing, but you can apply it to a lot of deep sort of ideas and I also use it a lot to explore the idea of something that is literally haunting my characters like something that's happened to them a choice they made a choice they didn't make something that you know something that some type of trauma that they haven't dealt with and it's haunting them and it's preventing them from moving forward and so I make I parallel that with like an actual haunting that is preventing someone from moving forward and it's sort of a cool way for me to add that imagery in to what's going on with the characters. Speaking of scary things, um, you started writing the book of cold cases right before 2020, I believe, mm-hmm. and the pandemic hit. How did that, um, how did this time period affect you as a writer or did it? I uh, Yeah, I finished, I turned, I turned the first draft of this book into my editor in, in February, 2020. So I worked on it for all of 2019 and I turned it in and I was like, ha, (laughs) (laughs) you know, of course I knew like there's that we were going into the revision period, but then the pandemic hit and um, it was, the pandemic has been very hard on writers. Like it's been hard on everybody. And because it's just been impossible. It was impossible for a long period of time to do the really deep, deep, deep creative focus that you need to do to write a good book. You know, like everyone's attention was so fragmented for so long. Like you were on the news and every hour was like, you were had to go check the news again. And and you were talking to friends and family. And now what, now what's going on? You're looking around what's going on in your local area and what's closed and what's happening. And now what, now what, now what? And, and so it was just, it, it was so hard to have sustained focus, Never mind to like, forget about the world and go deep into the world you're creating and just live there for a couple hours a day and try and make it seem really, like it was just impossible to do. Um, so that was my main the main thing that I think a lot of writers have dealt with during the pandemic is just the impossible, it's been impossible to focus. And if you can't focus, you do not, there are no books. (laughs) The book does not happen. If you're, if you're like on Twitter and your social media and you're got like all these emails coming in and people are calling each other and texting each other, like the the book does not happen in those little 30 second little increments. So um, that was a big challenge. And it was just, you know, it just comes down to like, you have to, I had to, you know, like shut down everything else on my computer and actually set a timer and be like, I'm going to just do 20 minutes. Like it has to be 20 or 30 minutes. And then I can, you know, go back into my distracted headspace. Um, and so I just had to do that as many times as I could. And some days you don't manage it at all. Um, you, you know, in 2020, for sure. Some days you didn't manage it, but um I think that we're, we're, we all felt, I think all writers felt that way for quite a few months. And we do have a few questions coming in from some of your loyal fans. So let me throw a few of those at you. The first question comes from someone who wants to know what is the scariest book you've ever read? Ever read? Yeah. Oh gosh, I've read a lot of scary ones. Um, Give us the top five. 
Okay, well, there one of the top five is definitely it's called I Remember You, yeah. and it's by an Icelandic author, and I cannot pronounce her name. Her first name is Irsa, and I can't remember. I can't pronounce her last name. And it, it takes place in Iceland. It's a recent book within the last ten years or so. It takes place in Iceland, and it's about a couple who buys a remote house in Iceland in the middle of nowhere, and they go out there and they're going to just live there and renovate it while they renovate it. And they're in the middle of nowhere renovating this house. And there's something in the house and they're in the middle of nowhere. And it's paralleled with this other story that's happening. And it's terrifying. It's just, <laughs> it was so scary. It was so scary because they're alone in this house and this stuff is happening. Anyway, it's really, really scary. That was, that's one of my top five. I remember you as one of my top five. I did. I got through the whole book. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get so scared that I bailed on it, but that's, um, that's one of my top five for sure. That would be one of them. There's another question kind of similar. This person would like to know, do you have a favorite true crime writer or case, I guess? Um, well, as far as books go, um, I mean, In Cold Blood is so good. I've actually read that with it recently with like, I read it a long time ago, but I reread it within the last five years and it's, it holds up so good. It's such a good book. Um, and I've read the stranger beside me a few times. That's a really good book. Um, and as far as like cases, I mean, Oh, I'll be gone in the dark is also more recently an amazing true crime book. One of my favorites of all time by Michelle McNamara. Um, so I would put those up there. Yeah, definitely. Most recently, I'll be gone in the dark is my top recommendation for true crime. Another person wants to know whether you write when you're writing, do you write for a particular audience in advance or you just write what you like and take the chance others will enjoy it? Well, my ideas always start as something that I'm interested in. Um, the book that I want to read the, and I'll come up with an idea, like, for example, with this book, I mean, I came up with the idea. I thought, what if you had like this potential, like terrifying, dangerous serial killer, but it was a woman. And, but you know, and you get this interview with this woman who's maybe a serial killer, but she was acquitted. And so for me, it was like, when I came up with that concept, my question to myself was, well, did she, did she do it? Like, did she do it? I didn't know the answer. So a lot of times the, the germ of the idea is just something I want to read. And I think, man, if I had that book, I would read that. Like I would read that hundred percent. So that's just where my original sort of germ comes from. And from there, you know, when you're a published author, you can't just go on these little flights of fancy. You have to actually talk to your publisher and say, (laughs) I'm interested in this. Are you, (laughs) <laughs> am I wrong <laughs> and they either say yes or no I have to say I, they they usually are very I have I get rejected rarely uh so by them but they you know I go to them and I say well this sounds interesting to me does it sound interesting to you and my editor will say yeah absolutely you should you should write that so it, it's a bit of a mix it starts it always starts out as something I want to read and then from there, if I'm lucky, my publisher likes it as well, or my editor likes it as well. And then it kind of, it kind of goes through stages from there where it's like, I'll kind of pitch a very, like a very simple idea, like the one I just said, like, just like a couple of lines and they'll, my editor will be like, I like that idea. And from there, I need to come up with a more detailed sort of treatment of what, who these characters are, where it's set, what the answer to the mystery might be. I have to do a bit of a synopsis and that's just, and I have to, you know, my publisher has to approve that too, because they need to know that I have a kind of a grip on where this story is going. Otherwise they're going to sit and wait a year. And I turn in something at the end of a whole year and it, the entire thing is, doesn't work or it's got some crazy ending or something. And there's a whole bunch of work that has to get redone. So I do have to give them a bit of a, a very, a very brief, like high level outline of where things are going to go. And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds good. Go ahead. And then I spend a year. (laughs) So it's, it's always a mix between what I want and what my publisher, not only does my editor have to like it, but she has to think that people will buy it. If people don't buy the book, she's out of a job. We're both out of a job. So that part is kind of her, that's where her expertise comes in. I think for those that are thinking of a writing career, it also depends, like in your case, you've established a track record. For somebody that's brand new, it's going to be more difficult to sell an idea that may be out of the box 
But if you like your books have shown that there are readers, it's a little bit easier. It's not always the easiest, but you can kind of say, yeah, there's. Yeah. And again, like I could come up with an idea that my publisher thinks will not sell. Like, you know, I, I, what, after Maddie Claire, after I sent them Maddie Claire, they, they asked me to pitch another idea and I pitched them a vampire idea and they said no. And at that time, cause that was 2010. So that was, that was twilight time, right? Vampires were hot. So, yeah. <laughs> so I pitched them and I, my vampire idea was not a twilight type vampire. It was like a really, really scary vampire. And they were like, if you put, if we put out a vampire book in 2010, no one will buy it. There will be no sales. No, it's not a single person will buy this book. We're all finished. So, <laughs> Cause it's a tw- twilight. Every vampire book is just twilight. That's it. And that was kind of fair enough, you know? So, I mean, I, I probably should pitch them another vampire book. Cause now it's 12 years later, but um, at the time, like that's, that's why I say like, it's not just, Oh, that sounds good, but they kind of have to look at the market as it, as it sits in that moment and say like a vampire book will just tank at this point. So some, you know, what I, so I can come up with stuff that's interesting, but a publisher can still think, well, no, like this will not sell. And that they just can't, they just can't publish books that they don't think will sell. They're not always right. They don't know, yeah. they don't know, you know, everything, everything. Yeah. but they make pretty educated guesses based on their, pu- what's selling for them at the moment and what's selling, you know, so they have a lot more data than I do for sure. So they make kind of educated guesses on that. Another question from a reader is, do you have a strategy or how do you build tension and suspense in your writing? Um, the main way that I do it, honestly, is with revisions. Yeah. The book that you read is not, it doesn't just flow onto the page like that. The first draft is terrible. It's got a bunch of junky scenes in it. It's got a bunch of clunky dialogue in it it's got even sometimes subplots and characters that just don't work and I have to rip them out so you know going through it myself and going ah I can already tell these things don't work I have to fix it and then I go through it and I revise it as much as I can before I turn it into my editor and then my editor goes through it and she says you got all this right but this part over here still needs to get fixed so there's there's a lot of revision that goes in um it, it is far from what my first draft looked like. Um, and the better you can get at revisions and the more you can just handle the fact that you have to revise your work, the better it's going to be because it is hard to do. Like, you know, you, you put so much work into something and either you know yourself or your editor says to you like this whole section, this whole subplot doesn't work and it doesn't add any tension and it just sort of drags and it just sort of, you know, the action just sort of halts while you've got the subplot going on, just rip it out. And the first thing you want to say is, well, you're wrong. Like, no, I did all this work. <laughs> so it's hard to get into that mindset where you're like, no, this, like what's going to actually make the story better. What's going to make the book better. What's going to make it flow. What's going to make, what's going to hook that reader in and keep them turning every page. Um, sometimes it, like some parts come out really, really good and need very, very little revision. Some sections come out like, you're like, I am on it. I got it. And then the other sections is like, nah, I gotta like some, so I've had, I've had times where I've had to delete like 50 p- pages, like just can't use any of it. It's gone. I got to start over. And so, and that's, if, you, if that's what you have to do, then that's what you have to do. Another question is how much input do you have as an author into your book's covers and titles? And you do have some really great um, titles and covers. Um, yeah, um, so titles, um, titles are kind of a collaborative thing. Um, they will, my publisher will ask what I, you know, well, first of all, when I'm drafting, I come up with a working title. I come up with this is, you know, and it, I even, I know at that point, like it's not necessarily the final title. It's just the title that I'm working with. And at, my publisher will, you know, again, they're looking also, they're looking at whether uh, like there are a hundred other books out there that have that same title. And then you're going to have, they're going to have a harder time selling that title. So um, like, for example, my, my working title for the Sundown Motel was Night Shifts. Mm. The character works at Night Shift. And like when it came time to decide the title, well, um, Stephen King has a book with that title. Um, so does J.D. Robb or, or Nora Roberts. Um, and um, 
there was one other like just mega author that has that title and so it was kind of like well if i'm compete i can't comp- you know i can't compete yeah. against those that against those three anyone who looks up that title is going to see the, them and then i'm going to be way down at the bottom so we changed the title so there's a lot of different things that go into that title i come up with ideas my publisher comes back and they have ideas we kind of go back and forth and sometimes their idea is what sticks and sometimes mine is what sticks like i say sundown motel that was my that ended up coming from my editor because my idea night shifts was too well used oh charlene harris that was the other one that i had used that kind of kind of big kind of big. yeah and so sundown motel was them um the book of cold cases was my idea because that was the name of her website and we were like what should the title of this book be and we went back and forth and we brainstormed and i said well, what about just the book of cold cases and that ended up being it that, so that is a very back and forth, that is a very collaborative thing. They definitely want the author's input. They want the author to come up with like, like if, if, if the title hasn't been decided on, they want like maybe a dozen ideas. Like they want to come up with all kinds of stuff. The cover is very much um, the publisher's uh, domain. They have an art department. Their art department is extremely skilled. I do not have art skill. <laughs> <laughs> Their art department is extremely skilled. They know what they're doing. Um, now, if they make me a cover, like I get to see the cover months in advance. And if they make me a cover and I like, if I d- detest it or it's really awful, which has never happened to me, but if that happens, I mean, I can protest and mm-hmm. start an argument about that. But I've never had to do that. Um, like I've, you know, sometimes I'll just have a few suggestions like changing the name of the color or of the font or something so minor like they just do such an amazing job um so that is very much the publisher's domain and if i because i'm lucky and because they're very good at what they do i've never had to have a huge say in that because they know a lot better than i do but on that and they do a really really good job another person would like to know what is the best piece of writing advice you've ever received the best piece of writing advice I've ever received. Um, I uh, One piece of advice I go back to, I think it was Elmer Leonard wrote it. And one of his advice, pieces of advice that he wrote about was um, uh, uh, delete the parts of your book that people tend to skip. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and like that is seems so simple and yet you can go back to it over and over and over again as you're writing the book and go if I was a reader when I skip this then it does not need to be there and like I just go by myself as a reader when I skip and so it's like ha, like if there's a long like I say if there was a scene of someone googling things I would skip I would skim mm-hmm. right so I don't I try like I ha- sometimes my characters have to google things but I make that as like brief as humanly possible and that's one of the ways I keep the pacing moving. That said, I tend, when I, when I do my first draft, it tends to be a little bit short. I tend to kind of leave a little bit too much out. And then my editor comes back and says, well, you could, you know, like there could be a little more, you know, dialogue over here, or you could see a little more of this person's life, like everyday life. And you could kind of add some stuff in because I tend to just be like, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. and that's the end. <laughs> so like, well, that's, we could get a little more in, but I, that's one thing I live by is just, I just, if I would skip it as a reader, I ha- you have to delete it and deleting it, deleting your writing is really hard to do. It's really hard to do. And you got to learn to do it. And you got to be like, it's got to go. It's got to be gone. If it doesn't work, it's got to be gone. I think it was some writer that said you have to kill your darlings or something. Yes. Yeah. And it's funny because a lot of authors like, and this is very common, a lot of authors, like when they have to delete something, they actually like copy it and paste it into like a separate little word document and they they just call it like their little, like their, their deleted file or something, but they could actually save the writing into another Word document because they just can't quite let, delete it all the way. <laughs> I have never done that. I have never done that. When I delete something, I just, I just hit the button and delete it. It's gone. I have no saved little darlings anywhere. I'm like, this has got to go. It's got to go. I, had, I just had to cut, I just got to cut it out. So uh, that's how I work, but that's not how a lot of authors work. A lot of authors like have a little special little file where they keep stuff and like I might use this someday (laughs) (laughs) 
Um, another one of your readers wants to know, what is your, so your relationship with social media and do you have a favorite platform as an author? Yeah, um, social media, um, I've, I do enjoy social media to an extent. Um, I enjoyed it a lot more once I, like, once I learned my own boundaries and just set them and stuck to them. Um, you know, I go, I don't go on for too long. I don't, you know, get too, I don't get too sucked into it. I don't get sucked into like online debates or online arguments or anything like that. Anything that's going on about the publishing business. I just like back, stay out of it, all of that. So for me, social media is like, it's basically just another way for readers to reach me. So if, you know, cause I do, I get, I get the odd Facebook message or I get the odd Instagram message or I get the odd Twitter message or they just at me on Twitter. And it's just a reader saying, I really like this book. And so for, for me, I've just learned to see it as another way for readers to just, to just say hi. And as long as I keep that front and center in my mind, I think that it stays a little more enjoyable. Um, and my favorite platform, um, I actually really like Instagram um it's been really nice uh i have a lot of i have a lot of readers on instagram in the last few years and they're really they're really enthusiastic um so that's actually turned out to be a quite a nice place to be there's a few more questions um one person would like to know whether your parents and family are supportive of your reading and writing or did you get a lot of support early on i guess uh yeah i my family was never a, a huge like literary family. Um, it wasn't like I had any like role models where it's, they would think that I would be a writer. But, um, you know, my parents, mostly what they did was they just absolutely did not monitor what I re read at all whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, and I would, I, if I would, they would, my mom would take me to the library and I would check out what, whatever I wanted. And she never even looked at what I was checking out. And she was just like, you just pick something. And I would just check out whatever I wanted. And so that was one of the things that my mom did was she really let me ex just explore whatever I wanted to read without her opinion or saying I, you can't or this or that. So, I mean, I just read whatever I wanted. And when it came time to be a writer, yeah, um, my mom was very supportive and um yeah my my family was very supportive of it and they were i think that when i first got published they were all pretty surprised i think that any <laughs> family would be where they're kind of like because you know they they hear from me for years and i'm like yeah i'm doing i'm writing something and they're like good for you and then i'm like no i'm a publisher and they're like really like a real one because none of them had read anything i i'd written i i had, I had never offered it. i was like you can't you know I, I you can't read this so they were just kind of like supportive like in theory they're like yeah you should do whatever makes you happy and then that was like you, someone's actually going to publish this and and you get a lot of questions where it's like is it like a real publisher is it a real <laughs> yeah like a real one in new york <laughs> <laughs> so it took a little while for them to figure that out that like a real publisher was going to publish it but um they're they they're excited um and my sister buys all my books and puts them on her shelf and she has them on her shelf and They've been great. They've been, so is my, my husband has been a huge supporter from day one. I, like that, it's really important to have that. Um, it's just a thousand times harder if you don't have that. Um, another person would like to know whether you're a night person or a morning person and when do you write? I'm a morning person. I'm freshest in the morning. I get up pretty early and I'm freshest in the morning. Um, I don't always write in the morning, um, but usually when I do, that's my best writing. Uh, so, which was actually, that was why it was hard for me when I still had a day job because I had to get up and go to work and I would have ideas buzzing through my head and I had to wait until I got all the way home and then ate dinner and then it was the evening before I could actually write stuff down. I would have a spiral notebook with me, but to, to put in any serious time writing, I always had to wait while I was thinking about stuff. So since I've been a full-time writer, really what I do is I, uh, because I couldn't do it for so many years, I just let my creativity tell me what it needs to do. So if I wake up and I've got 
an idea and it's kind of cooking, but I'm not ready to actually write it down yet. Then I'll just go about my day. And then maybe after lunch, I'll sit down and I'll be ready. I'll know like what sentence I'm going to start with. And other days I wake up and it's like, I'm just going to sit down and do it. Um, when, you know, I'll just have a cup of coffee and that's the only thing and I'm ready to go. So I, I, because I have that luxury now, I let my creativity tell me when it needs to work. And it's not always the same time every day. I certainly am not a night person. Like I would never be writing at 2 a.m. I am asleep at 2 a.m. <laughs> some, writers, some writers are, are night owls and that's when they work. But that is definitely not me. I have no creativity in the middle of the night at all. I'd say my creativity is highest in the morning and during the day. We have a couple that I'm going to roll into one kind of question. Um, they want to know, what have you read? You mentioned some books that scare you, but what have you read recently that you enjoyed? What is currently on your nightstand? Um, I recently, I enjoyed a book called A Flicker in the Dark by Stacey Willingham. It was a debut book that came out in January. I think it hit like lists and it did really well. So I read it. Um, it was really, really good. It's like, it's about this grown woman whose father was, is, was a serial killer, was put into prison as a serial killer. And there's like a whole present timeline. I'm not going to give anything away, but it's like a serial killer thriller. Um, really well done. That, I enjoyed that quite a bit. That one did really well. Um, on my nightstand right now, I just started, it's called Chasing the Boogeyman. Richard um, Chismar is the author. Yeah. I'm the only a couple chapters in. It's fantastic, but it, I picked it up because it is kind of like it's, it's like a true crime. Uh, so there, I don't think there's I, well, I don't think there's paranormal in it unless there's something that's going to surprise me later in this book. But it's like a true crime thriller, um, and it's really really cleverly constructed. Where you, it seems like it's a real case, and you're kind of googling, going, "Is this? Is he writing about a real case? Because this is like this is." a novel like it's supposed to be a novel but it seems really real um so if you love true crime i definitely recommend that one i'm not done it yet but uh it's definitely sucked me right in it's really creatively done um what are you working on now or what can we expect from you as a writer uh yeah I'm work my next book is pretty much pretty much done um we have agreed on a title although i have not been given the go ahead to give it out i'm not sure of the date yet but I will say that it is this next one is a single timeline and because just that's how the story went. And um, it's about a couple that takes a wrong turn and they pick up the wrong hitchhiker on the wrong road mm -hmm. and things go worse from there. So um, it's, it's a real, it's a, it's a real adventure and it's, it's another ghost story again. And so, yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun to write. So I'm looking forward to that. It sounds fantastic. I can't believe we're already out of time. You've just been a fascinating author. Before we um, conclude, I do want to let people know. I know people are sometimes hesitant. If you're like me, you're a reading chicken. You don't really want to read books that scare you, especially if they're um, might be too graphic or too gory. But I can honestly assure you, I am a reading chicken and I love Simone's books and her latest one. Uh, the Book of Cold Cases was amazing. I finished it in one day, and then when I went around the house that night, turning out lights and getting ready to go to sleep, I thought about it for a minute, and I said, I'm going to sleep with the whole light on <laughs> I did that for about a week. I will say, yes, that, that's what I like to read, something that spooks me, but mm. I'm not, like, destroyed afterward. Like I, yeah. And I will, the only spoiler about this book I want to give out, because I got asked about this, is that there is a cat in this book, and the cat does not die. That is my big spoiler. I, if there is ever a cat or a dog in any of my books, which is there are several, I will never, ever, 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 ever kill the cat or the dog. So I am confident giving that spoiler out because I get the odd reader and they're like, I'm partway through this book and there's a cat. Mm -hmm. And if you kill this cat, I'm closing this book right now. And I'm like, I don't, I don't kill the cat. I don't kill the cat. The cat's alive at the end of the book. <laughs> so that's the only spoiler I want to give out. That's important. Um, yes. I want to thank Simone uh, St. Oh my goodness, I forgot your name. Simone St. James. <laughs> I was so excited about that for joining us. Uh, we do have copies, a few with autographed book plates of the Book of Cold Cases. I want to thank those tuning in to another virtual author event at the Poison Pan. And I'm looking forward to your next book when it comes out, Simone. Thank you. Thank you so much, John.